chapter. It's coming from Genesis, chapter 28, verses 10 through 19. So Jacob left the town of Beersheba and started out for Haran. At sunset, he stopped for the night and went to sleep, resting his head on a large rock. In a dream, he saw a ladder that reached from earth to heaven, and God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing beside the ladder and said, I am the Lord God who was worshipped by Abraham and Isaac. I will give to you and your family the land on which you are now sleeping. Your descendants will spread over the earth in all directions and will become as numerous as the specks of dust. Your family will be a blessing to all people. Wherever you go, I will watch over you. Then later, I will bring you back to this land. I won't leave you. I will do all I have promised. Jacob woke up suddenly and thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't even know it. Then Jacob became frightened and said, What a frightening place! It must be the house of God and the gateway to heaven. So when Jacob got up early the next morning, he took the rock that he had used for a pillow and stood it up as a place of worship. Then he poured olive oil on the rock to dedicate it to God, and he named the place Bethel. Thanks, Dennis, for bringing us the gospel again, as only you can. Responding to the God experience. You know, about 20 years ago, uh, a good columnist writing for the Chicago uh, Tribune by the name of Bob Green, he wrote a book, just a little book called Good Morning, Mary Sunshine, and it was about his daughter. It chronicled his daughter Amanda's first year of life. And in it, uh, there's, a, there's something that he wrote in it that I think has bearing for uh, our, our message and, and our experience today of worship. He says, when little Amanda began crawling, he, he wrote this in his journal. He says, this is, this, this is something I'm having trouble getting used to. I'll be in bed reading a book or watching TV, and suddenly I'll be alarmed. Uh, I kind of get spooked, and I'll look down at the foot of the bed, and there will be Amanda's head at the foot of the bed just staring up at me. And apparently, I've become one of the objects that fascinates her now. It's so strange. Uh, after months of having to go to her, to get her attention, she is now choosing to come to me. And I don't know quite how to react to it. All I can figure out is that she likes the idea of coming in and being in my presence and just looking at me. And the most wondrous thing about this to me is that she apparently doesn't expect anything in return. She doesn't want anything. She just looks at me. I return her gaze, and in a few minutes, she decides that she needs to be back in the living room, and off she crawls again. Friends, that, that simple and wondrous pleasure of just being in the presence, of looking at the one you love, is what we enjoy as Christians every time we worship God and come to just bask in God's presence, expecting nothing in return. That's the experience that we want to pursue this morning and every morning in worship. And the story uh, out of Genesis that, that Dennis read for us about the, the patriarch Jacob, that's a story of Jacob's personal transformation through his relationship with God. And from what the Bible refers to as the natural man or woman into a spiritual person, which looks a lot more like Amanda. But let me explain. The natural man, or at least its Greek equivalent, was a phrase that was coined by the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth. And it was to refer to unspiritual people. By natural, Paul didn't mean outdoorsmen, okay, or nature lovers, but people who kind of live and deal with life from rather their human nature instead of from the guidance by the Holy Spirit. For Paul, the natural man or woman is the very opposite of the spiritual man or woman. Natural individuals now are not necessarily bad people or even necessarily ungodly people. It's not even to say that unspiritual people don't pray. They often do, especially in times of danger uh, or extreme want or desire or emergency, you know, a crisis. They say, what, there's no atheists in foxholes, right? These people will pray sometimes, even as a matter of routine. You know, they often say, maybe, grace before meals. The only thing is, 
the prayers of the natural person tend to be more about what that person wants than what God wants. Which brings us to Jacob in our Genesis passage for today. Now, Jacob can be called a natural man if there ever was one. Jacob looks only to his own interests. If you've read, uh, if you've read any of Jacob's life up until this point, he looks only to his interests, uh, and this has caused him to basically, well, make a mess of his life. If you, as I said, read earlier in his life, you'd know that he, uh, Jacob has cheated his brother Esau out of Esau's birthright. He's already lied and deceived his poor old blind dad into giving him the blessing that was meant for his brother Esau. And now he's kind of on the lam. He's running away from home and from his problems because uh, things have gotten too hot for him there. He's running for his life. <clears throat> but God, who never gives up on those who... God has created in God's image, continues the work of recreation in Jacob's life and comes to Jacob in a dream, promising to give Jacob many descendants who will be blessed and who will occupy the land in which Jacob has been sleeping. What's more, God promises to always be with Jacob. God promises God's unconditional love to him. When Jacob wakes up now, he realizes that something very important has just happened. And that although he hadn't expected it, the Lord, God, was really in that place. And what Jacob does next suggests that he does take things seriously. He sets a stone on end as a pillar of, or memorial and then pours oil on it as an act of, uh, of worship and blessing. And then Jacob prays. Unfortunately, what comes out of his mouth shows us that the God experience has not changed Jacob's nature yet. He's still very much a natural man. His prayer goes like this. If God will be with me, and if God will keep me in this way that I go, and if God will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I may come again to my father's house in peace, then... The Lord will be my God. See, this prayer is not all about what God wants, only about what Jacob hopes to get out of his encounters or his experiences with God. You know, back in 1965, uh, speaking of prayers, you know, right and wrong prayers, natural or, or spiritual prayers in the spirit, uh, in 65, there was a British author by the name of David Head, and he wrote a wonderful little book uh, titled, he sent leanness, a book of prayers for the natural man or person, in which he talked about the unspiritual prayers that we all sometimes pray. And he included in that book Jacob's conditional if-then prayer after his own experience with God. Head writes that everyone thinks about God, but that we should switch our hearts on and turn those thoughts into prayers constantly. He goes on to say that there's all kinds of prayers. They can be silly, harmful, childish, mis misguided, and selfish. But any prayer that reaches out toward God is never cast out. He says it's always better to pray even foolishly than not at all, as long as we, we remember that we do not, cannot control God. David Head's main point in his book is that when you and I pray, only out of our natural, unspiritual state, we will always miss out on the greater, the much greater riches that God wants us to have and to experience. You know, interestingly, the title of his book, He Sent Leanness, is from the Bible. It's from a verse in Psalm 106. In that psalm, the, the, the psalmist has, has been talking, kind of rehearsing uh, the people of Israel's experience in the wilderness. He tells of God, you know, rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt and then saving them from the pursuing Egyptian army by drowning the army in the Red Sea. And then as the people are going through the wilderness, they're complaining. In, instead of trusting God to care for them, they complain. They start demanding things. They demand drink and food and especially they demand meat. And then the psalmist observes and God gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. 
Friends, that's the problem with our prayers when we're, they're motivated only by what we want instead of by a desire to find out and pursue what God wants. You know, God may even give us what we ask, but it can come at the price, like with the Israelites, of leanness of soul, of finding no real lasting satisfaction from our gift. We eventually find that instead of enriching our lives, what we prayed for is diminishing or impoverishing our life because we are using it wrongly. So what can you and I learn from Jacob's experience and, and take away from it this morning? I think simply this. Our prayers are not to win God over to our side, to push God to do something that we want God to do for us. God already knows what we want and more importantly, what we need. Here's the thing. You and I are shaped and molded by our prayers, by what we ask of God continually. Therefore, we should ask continually for the Holy Spirit so that we can cease to be a natural man or woman and become a person guided and filled with, to overflowing God's own spirit of love and peace and joy and life. And if we're going to pray honestly, our prayer for the Spirit may have to be one of the natural man or woman right now, you know, at the moment. Something like, Lord, I really don't want to turn my life over to you. I, I want to do my will, not yours. That's just who I am right now. But that's not who I am content to be. So please help me to want your Spirit within me. Now that's a start. A prayer that says to God, I want what I want, but help me to want what you want is the prayer of a natural man or woman. But it's a prayer that's on the way to helping that person become a person of the Holy Spirit, a person uh, on the way to experiencing not leanness, but the fullness and the joy of the Lord. Okay, let's, let's bring this, uh, bring this home and, and make our God experience personal for each one of us this morning. Um, about the time uh, Bob uh, Greenwood was, was uh, writing his, uh, his uh, chronicles about his, his daughter Amanda, uh, there was another book that came out. It's called Beyond the Worship Wars. It was by Dr. Thomas Long, United Methodist. And, and Dr. Long was alarmed by conflicts that were arising across you know, Christendom uh, in churches about the question over which was right. Was traditional worship or contemporary worship the way to go in music, you know? And so he set out to determine, you know, what makes for excellence in worship? Does it need to be the high church worship and liturgy, or can it be a more casual, you know, contemporary sound and feel? And he interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of church leaders across the country. He studied, actually, the top 20 churches that were growing uh, both spiritually and numerically. And their styles of worship actually ranged all over uh, the traditional to contemporary spectrum. But what Dr. Long found uh, were some common denominators. And the common denominators in all of these growing spiritual and numerical churches was they included the qualities of warm hospitality, excellent music, commitment to mission outreach, and thoughtful preaching. The most important quality, though, that he found is that all of these thriving, growing, spiritually alive churches make room somewhere in the worship service or celebration for the experience of mystery. In other words, these churches realize that, that worship is a place, perhaps the best place, where human beings encounter the living, loving God. And the services these churches carefully craft are, are more than just musical concerts or thoughtful sermons or lively social gatherings. They are an event to which people come expecting to be touched somehow by the divine presence of God. They come expecting to feel God's Holy Spirit humming alive within them. Now, in one sense, it's impossible to plan a divine human encounter, okay? 
For the wind of the Spirit, as Jesus told Nicodemus, blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And in another sense, it's difficult to plan a, a, a divine human encounter or experience when there's a deadly virus preventing us from coming together in person to share physically and communally in that experience. And yet, we can always, always, even during these trying times, wherever we are, whether alone or with others, we can still approach online worship in such a way that we're watchful and that we're hopeful and that we're attentive. We can pray beforehand for a blessing from God before we click the link and join the service. And we can talk afterward with others, either in our home or, or in the online fellowship, about the ways that God has made such blessings real in our lives. We can share that. And most of all, we can come to God's house often, openly expecting that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Dennis? Yeah, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Thank you, Jamie, for inviting me to help conclude our celebration today and just to share some of my thoughts and, and some of my, my time in prayer with the Lord here with everyone that's here watching us at this time. You know, as Jamie kind of pointed out, and he set, set us up to this point here, reminding us that in the Gospel of John, you know, Jesus borrowed the imagery of Genesis and Jacob's ladder when he called Nathanael to his disciple by saying, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And Jesus was saying, in effect, I am the gateway to heaven and the ladder that leads human beings to a divine encounter with God. We're going to open ourselves to the presence of the Lord in this place. We're going to make a room for the experience of mystery. No prayers this morning of our wants and needs and desires, for as God's word assures us, he perceives our thoughts and needs from afar. Before a word is even on our tongue, he knows it completely. But this morning, let us come before God's presence and ask simply and only for what God wants of us. To not to have or not to want, to do or not to do, to be or not to be, to experience or not to experience. Well, let's this morning take the time and create the space to really pray the prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I invite you again to focus on the ladder, the chancel area here where I'm going to go and pray at the communion table, and just to where it leads from there. Because I believe that every person here watching this can find in these images that we've set here before you, they can find meaning and guidance and direction for your lives. And even more, the answer to your prayer, thy will be done as the Lord is calling you. So friends, as now we prepare from your home, wherever you are, to come virtually close to the communion table, Remember that this is how Jacob was changed from being a natural man to becoming a spiritual person. It was through his up-close and personal experience with God that brought him to this point. I invite you to wrestle with that thought as you draw yourself and those with you into a time of prayer this morning. When you've finished praying too, when you've experienced the awesome presence of God in your life in this moment, in this place, Set one stone upon another as a marker, as a remembrance that this is the place where you are. This is also Bethel, that is the house of God. I invite you now into time of prayer. God of Jacob, 
God of each and every one of us, surely your presence is with us at this time. Whether we are one and alone, we are virtually connected through space and time through the love of Christ. Lord, we've emptied ourselves. We've made this space open and ready to listen for your word. No thoughts of the material things, no thoughts of our burdens that we have here on our lives on earth. We've put those aside, Lord, and we listen now for your guidance. As we look to the ladder, as you look to the communion table, as we seek the bonds of Christianity and the love that unites us. Lord, during these moments, please write your will upon our hearts that we may carry them from this place, from this time, and out into the world, just to shine the light of Christ, boldly and proudly and with love. Help us, Lord, too, to carry this space with us, to remember that we don't have to be in a church, we don't have to be in our home to have the house of God with us. So let us share the Lord's Prayer together as brothers and sisters in Christ who are willing and waiting for your commands. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Set a marker for remembrance. Well, thank you again, Leslie, for the beautiful music. Surely the Lord is in this place. And thank you so much, too, for, for participating in our celebration today. I hope that you take it to heart and that you do remember to carve and make that space for meditation for God to write his will upon your hearts. I don't get to do this very often as I close out the celebration, so thank you, Pastor Jamie, for letting me have the opportunity here to do this. And so I can't think of a more fitting uh, way to close our celebration and benediction than to do it with a, a call out to uh, all of the confirmands that went through confirmation earlier this year. We haven't gotten to successfully conclude that program yet, but uh, Eli, this one's for you. And yeah, I don't have confidences, so I'm using the orange sheet. <laughs> so I don't mess it up. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Amen. <laughs>